Hi, and welcome back to the Teach Middle East podcast. My name is Lisa Grace, and today I have with me Kai Vasha, and he is the principal of the British School Muscat and the British School Salala. And we are going to be tackling some of the big questions in international education on this episode of the podcast. Um, questions so big that I'm so glad I'm not the one answering them and that Kai is because if I were in his seat, I don't know if I would have even where to start. But I think these are questions that we have to answer. I had a little bit of a quandary when I started to think about the topic of the podcast. I first thought we would um, ambitiously name it Rethinking International Education. And I thought well, that would be a bit pretentious. I mean, two people <laughs> rethinking the whole international education, but why not? And then I thought, well, what about tackling the big questions in international education? So if you're listening to the podcast, you know which one we kind of settled on eventually. But as we move through the podcast, um, if there's anything that resonates with you, get into the comments, talk to us. Um, obviously, we don't have all the answers, but we like questions, right, Kai? We love questions, absolutely adore questions, yeah. Um, so um, when we when we ask the questions, it opens up um, our curiosity. And so we can then start to think of solutions. So before I ramble on, um, let me introduce, ask Kai, sorry, to introduce himself. Welcome, Kai. Thank you, Lisa Grace. And it's an absolute privilege to be on the podcast. Um, really uh, have enjoyed listening to your other podcasts. So I, I do feel quite honored uh, to have the opportunity to sit in the hot seat, as it were. Uh, but yes, uh, my name's Kai Vasher. Uh, I had 24 years in the state system in England. I uh, worked in two state schools in Southeast England. And then I had a wonderful opportunity to work on innovation for nine years uh, with a big school improvement charity called SSAT. Uh, they're still functioning. Uh, and then I came out to Amman in 2011 uh, to become principal of Briscoe Muscat. Uh, and then since 2019, I've also been principal of Briscoe Salala, which is only 999 kilometres down the road uh, in the southern part of Amman. So I've had a wonderful experience in the Middle East, living and working and uh, working in education in this setting has been a, a fantastic experience. Brilliant. People always hear about Dubai and Doha and even Riyadh and Jeddah and not a lot about Muscat. Sell, a, sell Muscat to me a bit um, and to our listeners. What's great about Muscat? Well, first of all, it's different to much of the Middle East. So when you fly into Muscat, uh, you won't see any skyscrapers because uh, His Majesty Sultan Qaboos, uh, who was in power from 1970 to early 2020, he decreed that there would be no buildings over eight stories high anywhere in Amman. So when you fly in, you'll see very low rise buildings. What you will also see and what a lot of my colleagues really enjoy, especially when they have come from, let's say, Dubai or Qatar or other parts of the East, they love the geography. And as a geographer myself, uh, I, I can appreciate that, but you don't just have to be a geographer to appreciate it. We have mountains, we have deserts, like you have in other parts of the Middle East, we have wadis, we have 1,700 kilometres of coastline, and the biodiversity along that coastline, and I've just come back, just had our Eid break, and that's why I'm sitting here at home, it's the last day of our Eid break. I've just come back from Ras al Had, which is on the, the, the tip, of, uh, uh, tip of Oman, where the Gulf of Oman meets the Arabian Sea. And th there's a, a fisherman there who 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 uh, I, I who takes me out whenever I go to Razzle Hat. He takes me out on his on his fishing boat, and every time I go out with File, the fisherman, you see dolphins, you will see turtles, you might see whales, you'll see flying fish, you'll see manta rays jumping out of the water, you will see the most amazing wildlife in the sea. So, in addition to the camels and the goats and the wonderful wildlife we have on land. We also have on this 1700 kilometer stretch of coastline, the most amazing and beautiful seascapes and amazing things to see in the sea. And one of the best experiences I've probably ever had 
was last August when I was just off Muscat going on a snorkeling trip and I ended up swimming alongside a whale shark in the middle of the ocean. And that was the most incredible experience. So it's a great place for sold. natural beauty. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sold. <laughs> I, no, I actually have been to Muscat a few times and to Soha as well in Oman. My, my next on my list is Salala. Um, so eventually I'll, I'll ho I hopefully will get there. So we're here to talk big challenges and international education. So Kai, in your experience, what are some of these major challenges that we're facing right now in international education? Well, okay. Um, yeah, that's a, a challenging question itself to answer. Um, I mean, if I was in a school in England, which clearly I'm not, I'd be really frustrated that we had an assessment system, let's say at 16, where if I was in a sort of typical state comprehensive school, a third of my students would be failing. I would know a third of my school uh, students would be failing every year. I think that's a massive issue. If, if you imagine going into your, your year seven cohort and saying to those students, right, a third of you are going to fail in five years time. And that's the reality. That is the reality. Or saying to parents in reception, one in three of your children is going to fail in, uh, in 13 years time. So, so I think our assessment system is not in a good place, uh, but I'm fortunate that many international schools, I think are in this situation where actually that, it, that fact is not such an issue. I mean, pretty much a hundred percent of our children do succeed in that system uh, in Muscat and also in Slala. So that's not such a big issue at the moment, but I think that is a big issue. The second issue is teacher recruitment. I mean, I've been in education for 35 years and teacher recruitment, throughout that 35 years has always been a problem. And so that's a massive issue. And, and then the third issue, which I guess the pandemic brought out, but was already there uh, quite significantly before the pandemic, is the mental health of our young people. Uh, and that's now become a huge issue, I think in pretty much every school around the world. However, I don't think that's the, those are the biggest issues. So we've got all those, like today's problems, if you like, but I think the biggest issue we have is the world is clearly facing some serious problems and they are increasing every day in their complexity, in their severity and in their scale. And I don't think it's going to get any better. And that sounds a bit of a, a doom gloom sort of scenario. Um, but I think it really is, is presenting ourselves with the challenge, but also the opportunity of thinking how do we redesign our education system so our young people in our schools who are going out into this challenging world, which also has a huge amount of opportunity, how do we prepare them for that world so they can thrive, so they can be happy, they can live fulfilling lives, they can be happy in themselves, but they could also make a contribution to the world. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity because really the education model that we're working with hasn't really changed very much since the 19th century and is based on the industrial sort of principles of that time. So it's a wonderful opportunity. But I think that is our biggest challenge. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And I, and, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. So essentially what you're saying, our biggest problem is that the education system that we currently have is not fit for purpose. Yep, and I'm not the only person saying that. We've just launched, uh, I'm, I'm on the, uh, the board of KBIS, and we've got our, our annual conference coming up in a couple of weeks' time. And in preparing for that uh, conference, which is about uh, how do we prepare our young people for this changing paradigm, uh, we, we, we've launched a, a, a poll, very simple poll, and we're asking everybody around the world, uh, is our education system fit for purpose? Does it need redesigning? And so far, we've had over 100 responses. It just went live at the weekend. Well over 100 responses. And only 1% of the respondents, 1% think our education system is fit for purpose. So I think there is, there is a substantial feeling right around the world that at least in some elements, our education system is not fit for purpose. 
So I am, you, you can see the curiosity, for people listening, the curiosity is all over my face. So those who watch us on YouTube when this goes live, why then are we not changing? So if the education system has been stuck in the 1900s, yeah, and the case for its change has been so resounding, why then has it not changed? What's what's causing this this resistance to change? Um, that's a very good question, and I did a lot of work on this between two thousand and two and to, uh, between two thousand two and two thousand eleven, when I was working for SSAT in England, and we were working with schools and teachers to try and personalise education much more effectively. And schools were and are doing some fantastic work on redesigning education. But what you will hear a lot and fairly consistently from educators is they, they can do things in their own classroom and they, they can maybe move into, let's say, more project based learning or they can redesign the curriculum to an extent or they can take a, go a long way with, let's say, assessment for learning. They can go with digital te technology. But sooner or later, they will come up against an issue, particularly in secondary school, and they will say, well, I can only go so far because the assessment system is steering me in a particular way. And, and in the short term, I have a responsibility to prepare these young people. They need to do well in their GCSEs or A-level and IB. And I can't abandon those important exams because that, that's the passport to university or a job. And so I've got to prepare my students so they prepare really well in these assessment systems. And so the conclusion I came to after nine years of working with schools on innovation uh, in the UK was that unless we change the assessment system, it's going to be very difficult to affect things in school. And while I do believe very strongly that as educators, we do need to lead the change and that really policy, education policy follows practice and we can't depend on governments to make all the changes, we have to think about how do we work with exam boards and ministries and employers to redesign our assessment system, because that is the tail that wags the educational dog. How do we do it, Kai? How do we do it? Well, I think what, 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 we, what we are starting to see, and actually not just starting to see, we've seen for a long time, right across the Middle East, right across the world, there are pockets of fantastic innovative work going on in schools. There are teachers in classrooms doing some amazing work. There are schools doing some amazing work and there are pockets around the world. And you know, schools like High Tech High have been doing some really interesting work for a while. And what we, what we are starting to hear in addition to these pockets of innovation, and it's only happened in the last six months, and we can go into why that's happening in a moment, uh, but there is, I think, an increasingly groundswell amongst the profession, and I'd like to think right across society, that now is the time that we really need to look at what's, where are these pockets innovation, what are they teaching us about what's going on. There's also been some amazing research over the last 20 or 30 years of how we can do things differently. People like Angela Duckworth, for example, her, her book on grit, uh, which tells us a lot not only about what we could do differently, but also about what we're doing at the moment that has actually, is actually working really well, that helps develop grit and character education. So there are some very good things that exist in our system already, and we don't want to, that old cliche, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but I think we do need to start working together as educators and with people in the tech industry and other employers and ministries and shining a light on where these pockets of innovation are and looking at the research about how things can be done differently and start to reimagine. But I do think the, the schools, the leaders, the teachers, we need to take a lead with that. We can't expect somebody else to do it. I, I completely agree with you. But then I wonder, right, if the fact is that schools need to take a lead on this, and international schools are predominantly owned by businesses, 
predominantly you have your your, your not for profits in there etc why then have international schools not really propelled this change faster because a lot of them aren't beholden to the governments to a certain degree they could implement certain changes is it that they are succumbing to parent pressure um, what's causing the innovation in international schools to lag i understand for the uk there's a lot of governmental um, involvement etc but international schools what's causing the lag do you think uh, well i think there could be another thing a number of things that there is the pressure of exams there is the pressure of uh, ministry regulation and inspection regulation uh, those things can seem like they can get in the way of innovation yes there's parental expectation and yeah i mean many of our parents are paying fees or our companies are paying fees uh, for international education and for many parents they want their children they see the international education as a passport to a world-class university and to do that they've got to get decent exams so so there are there are those barriers however that th th there are there are well so th those that's one barrier i guess the, the other the other issue which maybe hasn't been shared so much recently and i guess it's something i've only started to realize maybe in recent years is you know my school's got a, a reasonable reputation for being innovative but but i when i look at my school i think we're we're, we're a good school we do we do things really really well but i don't think we're massively innovative but some people from a distance look at the school and think wow bsm is such an innovative school um and we are doing some really interesting things like the flex program with british school salala we're introducing a coaching culture so there are things that you can you can control but what what i also think isn't there in the training of school leaders and also teachers is how do you lead innovation and change in an education setting because it's actually really difficult and education and schools around the world are littered with endless examples of innovations that have been tried and failed um, and innovation is, is, is about failing but uh, as long as you keep moving forward but I think there is a skill set and there are there are there is knowledge and understanding and skills that you need to lead innovation successfully and it's not easy it is actually really difficult for all the reasons which you've said and so I, i've just started to do some work with the hpl network on a program that is looking at the harvard uh, innovation model of change and we are in the process and we're only in our first year at the moment with a pilot looking at how can we develop a leadership program that helps develop the skills and the capabilities of leading innovation in school leaders, because it isn't just go and innovate. It's it's actually pretty complex and it's hard. Um, and, and I think we need training uh, for our professionals to, to make that happen. I think uh, as well as training, we need that safety net because innovation means you're going to fall, you're going to fail, and you cannot innovate in a school if you don't feel safe. If you feel as if once your failure is exposed, you are exposed. Um, and so that level of safety is also pretty important if the environment will lend itself to true innovation, right? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, the, always the argument with, with, uh, with young people is that they only have one education. And if you, you innovate in such a way that you fail them and they don't get the grades they need, so they can't go to university, that's a serious issue. Um, but again, there must be similar parallels with medicine uh, where you know, they're, they're dealing with life and death. That's even more serious than uh, entry to university or the job world. So again, we, we can probably learn from the medical world. You know, how do you innovate in a sort of high stakes environment where you know, how can you create the safety conditions? How can you develop pockets of innovation, maybe incremental innovation, uh, which isn't so high risk and high stakes and puts the future of young people at risk? Yeah, I wanna go back, back, back 
and back again to something you said earlier about the fact that you've been in education for 30 odd years and even along those years you've always seen a problem with teacher recruitment but now i think there's a particular crisis what's feeding that crisis do you think kai help me out um well if i go back to when when i was thinking about getting into ed education being a teacher wasn't particularly cool um but if if somebody had told me back when i was 18 19 20 and think think about education but not telling anybody because it didn't sound like a cool profession if somebody had told me back then that i could be you know working in a school in oman and i could be working with schools across the middle east and part of an international scene that would have made it sound far more attractive at the time than it than it, than it was so I, I think partly that there's for a long time there's been a, a problem with the image of teaching and this awful statement you know that those who can do and those who can't teach terrible and um i mean certainly in the uk i mean all the time in the uk uh i didn't have the respect that i have now since i've been in oman for being in education in oman our parents our community are highly respectful of the school, of the staff who work there, of the leaders. I mean, it's a very respectful environment to work in. You, know, you go out to the supermarket, you meet families, and they're incredibly so sort of honoured to see you. And it's nearly like a, a celebrity status sometimes. So I think there is a problem in some parts of the world. And, and you know, a lot of us recruit our teachers from the UK, let's say. There's a problem with the status and the perception of what it is to be a teacher. It's interesting when you start meeting other people from around the world. I mean, I went to a conference in China a few years ago and they talk about teaching as the noble profession and the noblest of professions. And I think even here in the Middle East, the status of a teacher is very, very high. So somebody who is helping young people prepare the future, yes, that should be a very highly respected profession. So I think we've got a problem with, with how people perceive certainly in the UK, maybe in North America, maybe parts of Western Europe, uh, the perception of the role of the teacher. And that is linked to pay in those parts of the world, very often, especially in the UK. Uh, so you, And then you've got the working conditions and the, the salaries that you get in the UK and the accountability system. I mean, it's just not an attractive uh, job if you look at all those things to go into. Um, but I think as international education has expanded in the last 10 years or so, we've got a great opportunity, which the Department of Education in the UK is very reluctant to get involved in, is that if you position teaching as a global profession, so yes, do your training, let's say in the UK, and then maybe after a few years, once you've cut your teeth in a, in a state school, and that's still a brilliant place to, to learn as a teacher, You've got this opportunity to go and work anywhere in the world, in all sorts of different sorts of schools, different countries, different environments, and then come back. And I think if the Department of Education could embrace international education positively, you could imagine a market camp marketing campaign that positions teaching as a global profession. Uh, that's far more exciting to a, a Generation Z or Z whatever we call that generation, uh, far more exciting, who, who, who are looking for opportunities for travel. And yeah, and in, in some cases, you can earn some pretty good money in education and you can have, but most importantly, you can have the most amazing experiences and a wonderful impact on young people all over the world. So that should be one of the most attractive professions in the world. It should be, there shouldn't be a problem. But I think we need to market the job, the profession, more successfully than we do at the moment. Yeah, and I think you're right when it comes on to the Department of Education embracing that and making it attractive. Because if I think back to when I was in, you know, in education in the UK, it was not attractive. I, I think um, I probably have never said this before. I think um, my my family were like, really, <laughs> that's your choice. <laughs> So, you know, yeah, mine the same. My parents, both of them were teachers, and my, my grandmother was also a teacher. When I said to my parents when I was 21, leaving university, uh, I'm thinking about going to education, they thought I was crazy. They were, they, they were really thought I was crazy. 
uh, rather than being proud, whereas in many parts of the world, parents would be really proud that their child or the children were going in to become a teacher. So we've really got a problem with the status of the profession, certainly in the UK, and that's very, very sad. But so one of the joys of working internationally is that that's suddenly, that's turned on its head. Suddenly, you're one of the most respected people in the community. And, and how that makes you feel in terms of well-being, that really does make a difference. Because, you know, when I was in the UK and I was on summer holiday, I mean, I used to be embarrassed that I was on, you know, people would ridicule you because, oh, yeah, you're a teacher, you're on summer holidays now. Oh, yeah, it's all right for you in an easy life. I mean, yeah, it's it's terrible. And, yeah, so, but I think, you know, Working, working with COVID and BSME, if we can work with the DfE to position teaching as a global profession, I think we could, without a lot of creativity, uh, you know, completely change that that perception. Because now when I tell people what I'm doing back in the UK, they go, oh, that sounds pretty good. Wow, that sounds great. You're still out there. I'm going to stay out there for a while. That sounds wonderful. It is. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and I also found out, I don't know if it's still the case, that when teachers are going back to the UK and trying to find jobs, it's not the easiest because the perception of some school leaders when they're going the other way is that, oh, you're just coming back from having had, you know, a whole dose of sun and chilling and you you can't manage in our system anymore. And so they don't find that that easier time getting back into the education system in the UK. Now they might be desperate and need all the teachers they can get. But prior to this, it was always that kind of, you know, oh, you weren't really working, which is not the case. Um, have you, did you, did you ever hear about anything like that? Um, well, certainly when I was in the early years of being a teacher, some of my colleagues, when I was already then thinking about maybe teaching in Sashley, the advice was, don't do that. You'll never get back to the system. Yeah. And, and you were felt to you were made to feel that it would be a betrayal to abandon if like the state system and go internationally. Um, and unfortunately, sort of 30 years on, 25, 30 years on, I think some of those attitudes still prevail, unfortunately, rather than thinking, wow, you've taught in two or three different countries. Think of the international experience you're bringing back. Think about the international perspective you're going to bring back to those young people. Think of the connections that you might bring back with different parts of the world and how that's going to enrich you know, my school. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the pressures in international education are probably slightly different to teaching, let's say, in the state system in the UK. But teaching, wherever you are in the world, is one of the toughest jobs, as well as the most noble jobs. Because when you've got 20, 25, 30 young people in your class, you've got those 20, 25, 30 brains, and you're trying to help those people to learn and inspire them to learn and support them and encourage them and nurture them. That's highly rewarding, but it is, it's hard work. Wherever you are, it's hard work. And so, I, you know, again, if, whether we can work with BSME and KBIS, and we did some work on this a few years ago, just before the pandemic around teacher supply, but whether we can, with the DFE, work constructively on a campaign which talks about the value and the benefits that schools in the UK will have by welcoming colleagues back into the UK system, but, but see it as a as a sort of cyclical process that maybe you, know, you train in the UK, you go abroad for a few years, you become enriched, we, you come back to the UK, you then enrich the schools there and you keep in touch. They, why, why does it have to be you're either in the UK or you're abroad? Why can't it be, you know, you, you move in and out of the state system and the independent system say in the UK? And obviously there's opportunity for that now with the increasing number of British international schools around the world. Why can't it just be that there's a really exciting development experience for both teachers and for schools of people moving from one country to another and back again. And, and that, that exchange through the international sector, um, that will help education, that you know, bringing back of all sorts of ideas and experiences. It's going to be enriching for everybody. It's win-win. Yeah, I I agree. No, it definitely is a win-win. You know, I can I can definitely concur because when you go back, you're bringing back such richness with you that you can you can only but share 
what yeah. you've learned and what you've experienced. All right, so we're gonna go back to our big audacious questions, Kai, because you you you're doing some work on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in your school. Um, the wonderful Esther presented at BSME, and I loved her presentation and really applaud some of the work that's happening there. How can schools incorporate more diverse perspectives and cultural experiences into the curriculum, into the pedagogy, into schools? Yeah, well, I guess maybe the, the reflective question we all need to ask ourselves as leaders and as teachers and staff in international schools is look at the students in front of us. Look at the students in our classes, in our school. Look at the diversity there, because most international schools have great diversity amongst their student body. And think about the world that they are going to be moving into, the world we're preparing them for. And... So ask, ask ourselves those, those two questions and then think about that diversity in front of us. Think about that world they're going into because the world they're going into is heading east for, for, for sure. I mean, whether it's China or India, I mean, I think India's just taken over as the, the largest country in the world. The centre of gravity of the global economy is shifting eastwards. And we need to think about the diversity in front of us and the diverse world that our young people are going into and then think about our curriculum. Uh, and so, so what Esther did with uh, Leo and Katie and, and other colleagues in our school a couple of years ago, they, they across the school encouraged all our, our staff to audit the curriculum through that sort of perspective and then empowered our colleagues to think creatively about your curriculum. There's also a great opportunity for professional learning there. And think about how can you, not overnight, because you can't expect teachers to suddenly recreate and in, uh, innovate overnight in that area, but slowly over time, think about the, the, the people, the case studies that, that we sh we're, we're, we're putting in front of people to exemplify the knowledge and the understanding and the skills that we're trying to share with. and with support and with helping each other, the staff, I think it's a great opportunity for the staff, say for creativity and professional development, to slowly evolve the curriculum so it's more representative of the children in front of us and it's going to be more appropriate for the world they're going into. Yeah. You guys are doing um, a good job at beginning this work. I think where a lot of schools are falling down is that they're looking at it as something that is too big to handle. Mm. And so they're kind of burying their heads in the sand. Well, I think but, it's just small steps, isn't it? It's small exactly. steps. In English, is it, well, should I do this book or maybe I could do this book? Um, in history, it's, okay, we traditionally use these explorers. Maybe we can think about some other explorers which show, show a bit, you know, give a bit more perspective. Right. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be overnight. You know, every, every journey starts with a single step. Just take that little step and try to do something a little bit different and work together, help each other and work, you know, contact other schools who might have done that work. I mean, I'm sure Esther would, and, and she's in the process of doing this. I know she's setting up a network of schools across the region. Uh, let's help each other on this because, you know, we can, we can make the job a little bit easier. I think, I think getting, getting that network together um, and when Esther is ready, please do let me know. I'll blast it out to, to our readers because I think getting that network together will help in allowing schools to see what the good practice is in, in different places and just adopt and adapt. Yeah. Um, because I find that people tend to, not, not that they want to, but it's, it's easier to just pick up the curriculum one year to the next, the same resources one year to the next and just kind of do them as you would with your eyes closed. It makes your life easier. We taught this book, we learned it, we studied it, we know what it is, we can teach it again next year. Um, and so it, it means that little more effort to go and find a book by someone else that represents another culture or another um, race or, you know, but, but we have to take these steps. It's just completely necessary. And I'm like a real stickler for that because um, I, I do look at my boys, my kids' books and look at the stuff they're doing and 
sometimes I don't, I'm kind of like a slight nightmare to the teachers, but it's just what it is. I'm like, couldn't you have chosen something else? I mean, what about this and what about that? So I'm sure by now they know me in the school. So by now when my kids are coming up grades, they're like, who's getting her kids this year? <laughs> but I don't care. Um, right, let's, let's dive into something else that I know that you're passionate about and so am I. Um, the role of technology. So we, we, we know what's going on currently um, and I'm gonna pick your brains on it as where we go from here with it. Um, but how can schools ensure that students are develop, developing the technological skills that are needed for the world that we currently live in? So we're no longer talking about future because we love to talk about future in education when the future is currently happening. What kind of technological skills do schools need to implement um, and need to help their students succeed as we go forward? Yeah, well, that's a, it's a big question, isn't it? Because just every month, it seems at least this year alone, uh, you know, AI is developing at a rapid pace, incredibly rapid pace. And what are the, what are the digital skills or, you know, what are the, what's the, is it digital literacy? Is it computational literacy? I don't know. Uh, and I think we need to work with each other. And there's a fantastic event taking place in Hong Kong on the 1st of 2nd of June, hosted by Mark Steed, previously of these parts. Uh, his school uh, are hosting an event. It's also going to be online. And we're going to be exploring this whole, whole area of AI and, and what we should be doing. So I think it's a real opportunity where we can learn, learn from each other. Um, so, so that's changing rapidly. I think so. That there's the whole AI piece. What what you can do at the moment, and I think you and I both engaged with, with this work by Philippa Raithmel. She's written a wonderful book called uh, "The Digital Ecosystem," and I was just reading that over the the spring break. And she asks some really powerful questions in that book. Um, so if you didn't get that, that's the digital ecosystem, Philippa Raithmel, and she's working in Dubai at the moment. And she's asking some really important questions about what she calls digital governance. That's like who, who makes the decisions. She's really raising some interesting questions and she's providing some answers on digital safeguarding, because that's obviously key that, you know, young people are safe in this digital ecosystem that we're increasingly thinking about. And then she moves into teaching and learning. So that's a fantastic book. And I've just bought copies for my leadership team. And, uh, and we're starting to think about that. But I think straight away, the, 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 the paradigm or the concept that she's talking about, that we're no longer thinking about, like when I was leaving school in the early 80s, it was like, we've got a computer in the school. And then in the early 90s, it was, as a head of department, I've got a computer in my department. And then as we moved into the noughties, when I was visiting schools in the noughties as part of the school improvement charity, SSAT, I was working for, common question was, what's, how close are you to one-to-one -one technology? Because so for 20, 30 decades, it, uh, 20, 30, 20 or 30 years, it was all about devices, wasn't it? How many de devices have you got? What device? And then in the, like the last 10 years, is, you know, are you an iPad school or are you a Google school? It was all about the devices. And then suddenly this year, this calendar year, AI's come in and it's now suddenly, how is AI going to disrupt education? And it's suddenly got into, which I think is fantastic, it's how is AI going to challenge the assessment issue, which I was talking about earlier? Because AI, we've now got something that's coming into the world that can do many of the things that we are teaching in school and the kids are learning. So I think it is going to be a massive disruptor. We can't put our head in the sand we can't halt it for six months. It's coming. We've got to embrace it and we've got to use it for a positive uh, piece. But coming back to Philippa's work, this idea of the digital ecosystem. So instead of the devices, we're now thinking of this entire network, it's devices, it's, it's, it's networking, it's the software we use, it's all sorts of things. And it is this ecosystem that we need, we are creating now. So it's really complex. Uh, and, and, any good ecosystem will encourage and, uh, and nurture the growth of the students, in this case, and the staff within it. And so actually, I think one of the things that I'm working through at the moment, um, I just lost my 
a digital technology leader uh, at Christmas. He went off to the US. And so I've been without a digital technology leader for the last three or four months. And I'm using this opportunity not only to read Philippa's book, but to think about and discuss with my colleagues, with people like Philippa, with other colleagues around the world, what leadership do we need for our digital ecosystems in our school? Because I think it's probably different from what we've had in the past. Uh, and, and working that through, and because that's, if you like, where it starts, really. What's the leadership? Because we can't do it as, as head teachers on our own. What type of leader with what sort of skill set do we need to lead the management of this ecosystem that's going to help our students to grow? And so that's the question I'm working on at the moment. And I would like to think in the next few weeks, by the end of May, I'll be able to share uh, with you something I've been working with, Philippa, which is what this sort of leadership role looks like, which we will be advertising for sometime in the next few months. So I think that's a really important question for me at the moment. Yeah. Have you been using ChatGPT? I have used ChatGPT. Uh, it's it's quite it's quite a good. Tool. I've also uh, found. It, have you heard of Perplexity? No. Okay. So so one of the complaints, you know, all those weeks ago <laughs> when ChatGPT first came out, was that it will give you answers, but you don't know where it's getting the information from. Um, so if I put in, you know, what sort of school is British School Muscat, or is, who is uh, Lisa Grace Williams? Uh, it will give me some some data, but it doesn't tell me where it's got it from. Perplexity, uh, which only came out a couple of weeks ago, you can ask it the same questions as ChatGPT, but it will actually tell you where it's got the information from. So just Google yourself or Google a school, and it will tell you if, where it's pulling that from, whether it's from LinkedIn or whether it's from which school, or whether it's from the Cavis website, it will give you the information, but at the bottom of that information, it will tell you where it, so I think that's a, a really interesting development already in the last few weeks. And in terms of educational use, you know, when young people in our schools are used, if they're using perplexity, they can share with us where they've got that information from. And then they, they can go to those sources and maybe interrogate a little bit how, how credible they, they might be. So perplexity. Uh, that's something which my son shared with me only a couple of weeks ago. I've got to check that out. So as yeah. a head teacher, as a principal, how are you using, what are you using the AI for? What are you doing with it? Well, at the moment, I'm just playing with it. I'm, I've, I'm, I've asked it a few questions. Um, I've, when I've been looking for, when I've only made one or two examples, when I've, when I've started to look for some copy, I've, I've asked it questions. And see what it comes up with. I've sort of tried to test it to see uh, if it's got any Achilles heels, as um, Marquise Brownlee uh, suggests, uh, that it, it doesn't ever, always get everything right. So if you ask a question where maybe you think you know something about quite, you know, maybe it's about your school, or maybe I'm, I'm quite interested in coaching at the moment and quite a lot of research on that. So ask it a question and see, you know, how, how deeply you can dig before it starts getting stuff wrong, because it does get stuff wrong. Uh, and maybe that's reassuring at the moment, because we're a bit worried about this technology as well, being excited about it. But in, in terms of, have I actually used it practically for anything? Not yet, other than maybe for, I've started to use it for a bit of my research, if I want to find out something, instead of going to Google, and you go to ChatGPT, or actually I've used, in the last couple of weeks, I've used perplexity more because I think that's that's more interesting because it actually shows you where you, you're getting things from. But I'm just playing with it. I'm just playing with it and trying to get some sense of, of how we might start using it as a school. So what are your thoughts then on the systems that are now choosing to ban it? Well, and even Elon Musk was part of a group who was trying to halt it for six months. Um, I can understand their fear. I do understand it. Um, and, you know, we've had bans in the past on various forms of technology, you know, going all the way back to the printing press. Um, so I can understand the fear, but as uh, William Hague wrote in the Times uh, a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, we should think ourselves a bit like astronauts about to get into a space rocket. Um, there's a certain amount of excitement because we're going to the moon. 
but there's also a certain amount of fear because we, we don't know if the, the rocket's going to take us there or we, are we going to survive along the way. So I think it is right to be very cautious about it because we just don't know how powerful it might be. But what we do know is that it, well, it, I was going to say it's a powerful thinking tool. I'm not sure it is a powerful thinking tool. It appears to be a powerful thinking tool. It's actually not thinking, but it's, it's, it's something which already... I mean, if you just go on the internet, and I'm part of various um, WhatsApp groups and so on from with colleagues around the world, teachers and leaders are finding ways to for it to have practical use in the classroom, and maybe to reduce workload and to cut corners to get some really interesting tech, uh, educational uh, sort of uses of it. Um, a teacher toolkit posted some something today: ten points on how you can use. Chat GPT in the classroom, really practical, fantastic. Um, so those who are banning it, I understand the fear, but it is this great opportunity because it does, I think, certainly on the assessment front, it challenges what we're doing in schools because AI is now doing a lot of the things that we're doing in schools in a few seconds. Um, and it is going to challenge something that has needed redesigning for a long time, and that's our assessment system. And so I was really pleased to read about just a few days ago that there's one, I think, education think tank saying, well, this is going to lead to, for example, uh, a greater use of oral assessment. Um, because obviously that's much more difficult to use AI for at the moment. And so that interests me because going back, when I, when I entered education 35 years ago as a young geography teacher teaching a very progressive geography curriculum we have no content that's quite interesting um but there was no content and and this was the the bristol project and the avery hill project as they were known then and what we started to do this was late 80s early 90s just as the national curriculum would do pain was coming in what we were starting to do was thinking of those students who can't articulate their thoughts very clearly in writing, but could do it very confidently orally, the examiners were saying, well, devise oral assessments for them. Um, so this was going on over 30 years ago. We were starting to think about how that might happen. Obviously, it already happens in languages. They're doing oral assessments. They've got decades of experience. It happens in universities. So... Yeah, you know, th these are opportunities. Artificial intelligence is, is, is not only providing opportunities, it is going to make us think very carefully about how we redesign assessment. And so we are testing things which our students are going to need for the future, whether it's thinking about their creative problem solving, their decision making, their ability to think things through creatively, when they face problems for the first time, how do they respond to that? These are the real world skills they're going to need. Collaboration, teamwork, leadership, whole range of thinking skills they're going to need, which at the moment, our assessment scheme doesn't really get anywhere near assessing. So the, the skills that our students need, we're not really assessing in a big way. And I think AI, is going to shake up the assessment system. And as I said earlier, if AI as shakes up the assessment system, that's going to affect the curriculum and that's going to affect the pedagogy in our classrooms. Yeah, I agree with you. When I was thinking of the questions um, yesterday, I was kind of just going over them and doing my week ahead, what, what I have coming up type of thing. And I was mulling about, kind of musing about what skills would be most key as we move forward and I came up with two. Um, one is for the younger kids, their literacy skills will have to be on point. They have to be able to access this information. AI is no good to you if you can't read. <laughs> it's just no good to you if you cannot look and access this information. So that's one. And then as you get as you keep going, your critical thinking skills, because you're going to get so much information thrown at you that if you cannot decipher and think critically, then you're just going to be bombarded and you're, you won't make 
too much sense of it all. So, I mean, those were my two. And of course there are others, I kind of threw it out on LinkedIn and people have put different things, communication, collaboration, etc., cetera, um, which are all key. And I love the fact that it's shaking up the education system in a way that we start to rethink assessment because really regurgitation of information is what's the point of it when the information is at your fingertips, but you have to be able to access that information and to really look at it critically. So we've been on this for an hour, Kai. I knew that would happen. My, <laughs> My 30 minute podcast, which I always tell people, our podcast episodes are 30 to 45 minutes in length has now gone over an hour, but I don't care. I really loved our conversation. And I have one more question for you, which I think will kind of bring it all together um, and, and, and formulate like a closing statement. So given, given your experience and given the breadth, obviously, of the kind of work you're doing between the two schools. How can schools collaborate, right, with other institutions, organizations, stakeholders to create a more equitable and sustainable future for international education? Big question, but what do you think? Well, for a start, I think schools should collaborate. Um, and uh, I've learned a huge amount uh, not just in my time in the Middle East in the last 12 years, but when I was in the UK, working with the schools and visiting of the schools, some of the best CPD we can all have, whether we're leaders or teachers, is or, or, or in support staff roles as well, is visiting other schools and seeing what other schools are doing. Um, and and if, you, if, that, if those visits have got a focus, then that is fantastic CPD. And apart from the travel, it doesn't cost a huge amount. So let's visit each other's schools. Let's collaborate, let's work together. So using networks like, like, like you've been establishing, BSME, COBIS, these are really valuable networks and we can learn a lot from each other. So yes, let's collaborate and let's, let's find people who have got similar interests. We've now got social media. I mean, LinkedIn, I think as both you and I are finding is a wonderful learning platform. I mean, it's not like Twitter, uh, which I'm not spending very much time on at all these days. But what I'm finding on LinkedIn, I can learn so much from people like yourselves, from other school leaders all over the world. And it doesn't cost anything other than an investment of time. Um, and so, so we can use these social media platforms. We can use the organizations that are out there to help collaborate. But I think in terms of let's take the sustainability piece. Uh, which is a challenge, but we have got a, a, a massive issue with climate change, for example. Um, I mean, there's been an incredible amount of rain in the last few weeks in Amman. I mean, Amman normally has virtually no rain. I've just come back from, uh, from uh, a quick trip out to uh, the east side of Amman, and there's so much water on the ground. It's incredible, and that's unusual. Anyway, climate change, sustainability. I think we should be thinking about or could be thinking about in our schools, every individual in our, in our school uh, and across our schools, making a pledge every year about something that we're going to do that's going to be more sustainable. And we're actually taking the, the coronation as a British school coming up in a couple of weeks to do that. We're getting every young person to make a pledge and it can just be a small, a small step that they are going to do, which is going to you know, move to a better environment in their home for themselves or whatever. And so the pledge that I'm going to be making on behalf of my, my school is that we will not be using single use plastic in our school from next September. And I think you've seen me say this on, on LinkedIn recently. Um, and couldn't we all? as schools across the Middle East, can we all make that commitment that from next September or as soon as possible, we ban single use plastic and that the events that we attend, we all commit to, we are not going to go to events and there's going to be single use plastic there because all over this region, you will see beautiful deserts and mountains and coastline and you'll also see plastic and plastic bottles and it's terrible. And it's actually very easy, isn't it? You think, Let's not put a plastic bottle 
on the ground, let's put it in the bin. Or even better, let's not even use it in the first place. So I think maybe we, if we can come together as maybe schools across the Middle East and make those sorts of commitments, because then that makes it easier. And you know, like you've been doing with putting pressure on your school is, you know, let's put pressure on other, others who maybe want to festoon us with plastic bottles, but let's try and move into a different world where single use plastic is not part of our environment because it's killing our environment all over the world. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I remember that post because I went back to my colleagues and I'm going, I said, we need to give water bottles at our next event and we need to make sure that we have water stations around so people can refill and fill their bottles and that we're not having these bottles of water on the tables that people drink a tiny amount of the, the water and then they just leave it there or worse still it ends up in the desert or you know on a beach or somewhere so that that challenge is definitely accepted um the the issue is working with the venues now to say instead of just easily putting bottles of water on the table we want fountains placed in strategic places so people can refill maybe their refillable teach middle east bottles and so we're working on that we we want to do that for meslc 2024 i remember going to them and say, listen, I I think we need to go in this direction. So that that is something that we are working on. But thank you so much, Kai, for being on the podcast. It's been long and fruitful, and I didn't I, I in my head I knew it was gonna go over. I didn't know it was gonna go over over. But if you have listened to this deep end of the podcast, do leave me a comment. Do get in touch with myself or Kai, I'm gonna put his LinkedIn in the show notes. Um, tell us what you've learned, ask us a question, get in touch, let's start the collaboration. These are big audacious questions that we are tackling in education, but guess what? It starts with curiosity and then that leads to action. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Lisa, and I love what's behind you. Work hard, be kind. That's a great mantra for I think all our young people in our school. And, and our colleagues. Work hard, be kind. Thank you. Thank you so much.